The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the second chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. And it came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This census first took place while Quirinius was governing Syria. So all went to be registered, everyone to his own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth, into Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed wife, who was great with child. So it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished for her to be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Watch over their flock by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them and the glory of the Lord shone around them and they were sore afraid. Then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be for all the people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be the sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling cloths, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward all. And it came to pass, when the angels had gone away from them into heaven, that the shepherds said to one another, Let us now go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has come to pass, which the Lord has made known to us. And they came with haste. And found Mary and Joseph, and there the babe lying in a manger. Now when they had seen him, they made widely known the saying which was told to them concerning this child. And all of those who heard it marveled at the things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary, Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. Then the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen as it was told to them. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise Praise to you, O Christ. Christ. You may be seated. Merry Christmas. Well, can, can you see it now in the daytime? A small little baby in a small little manger near a small little town of Bethlehem. In a very real way, Christmas is God coming small. God comes to us in small ways. And yet, it is so hard to see small. Christmas is a full-blown industry in the United States of America. Muzak fills the malls, people deck the halls, we click on Amazon, grab the credit card. Before you can trash the holiday pumpkin, people are already singing, it's beginning to look a lot like Christmas. This time of year, we especially like happy towns, fast cars, warm houses, and shopping, big time shopping. Christmas is a big, loud business. And I'm not complaining. This preacher doesn't complain about that. No use complaining and being a Scrooge about business and people having fun. It's been a way of life for a long time. Somebody wrote in the fourth century, the festival is celebrated everywhere. The impulse to spend seizes everyone. People are not only generous to themselves, but also toward their neighbors. A stream of presence pours itself out on every side. The festival teaches people 
not to hold too fast to their money. Who wrote that? Well, his name was Libanius, and he wrote that way back in the fourth century, and it was not about Christmas. It was about a festival called Saturnalia. And Saturnalia was, was a pagan end-of-the-year festival, celebration, celebrating excess and pleasure as, as North Europe grew darker and darker. And guess what? It was in the fourth century that Christians decided to choose that same season for Christmas. Until that century, there was no official Christmas. Christians celebrated Easter, they celebrated Good Friday, then they added Epiphany, and it wasn't until the 300s that they added Christmas, and they did it at that same time of the year. The Bible doesn't tell us when Jesus was born, so the church picked what they thought at the time was the winter solstice, December 25th. So there you have it. Today, people will say, well, they're taking the Christ out of Christmas. Well, we stole it from the pagans in the first place, okay? <laughs> Give the pagans their due. So. For 1,700 years, we've had two things. We have had the holy season celebrating the festival of Jesus' birth amongst Christians and also a pagan festival of lights and gifts and parties, both of them at the same time since the 4th century. No use to whine about it now, okay? We live with it. If it were up to me, I'd give the secular season the name Yuletide, and the Christians could have the word Christmas, but we use the same word, so that's the way it is. However, what's important to us is that we gather as Christians throughout the world, beginning sundown on Christmas Eve, the beginning of Christmas and the birth of Jesus. We gather here for Christmas. Make no mistake about it, what Christians gather for is Christ Mass. That's where the word comes from. The Mass, the service of Holy Communion, celebrating on the day of Christ's birth. The Word becoming flesh and dwelling among us, the light in the darkness, as John says. So humans set the date. We thought it was good to have a birthday for Jesus. Humans made the calendar, but God made time. And God makes time, and God makes time for specific things in human history. God brings glory. Whatever date it may really have been, whether it was summer or winter or spring or fall, God made the time in human history. God comes on God's own time. And so Jesus was born, a small little baby near the small little town of Bethlehem in a tiny little country. Love comes down at Christmas in small and ordinary ways, in risky and vulnerable ways. God comes the way God chooses, and we don't get to decide that. It was risky, you know. It was difficult, no doubt about it, this birth of Jesus. Caesar Augustus, Gaius Octavian had ordered a census of the people, and he sent people scurrying everywhere to their ancestral homes. Octavian Augustus could care less how far they had to travel, how long it took them to get there. He could care less whether they had food or lodging. He just gave the order so he would know what people he could tax. Still the same thing today. <laughs> you fill out farms and the government go to tax you. So Joseph and Mary had to travel 80 plus miles from their home in Nazareth back to Joseph's ancestral homes. You can picture it, can't you? Joseph, worried no doubt about losing a paycheck 
during this period of time and worried about his pregnant wife, the child to be born. You can picture Mary, great with child, as the King James Version says. She was as round as a ladybug, just about to domino. The hotel full, the hour was late, the unsanitary lodging amongst smelly animals and great possibilities of infection. The pain of childbirth in the night. Shifty-eyed shepherds showing up. They were known for, for being unclean religiously and for drinking a little too much. And here they come saying, oh, we've seen angels in the sky. <laughs> really? What did they say? Well, they said that this child is the Christ, the Lord, the Savior. Now, that's a dangerous thing to say. The angels took a great risk. I mean, the, the shepherds took a great risk in saying those words because the emperor had stone plaques throughout the whole empire. And those plaques carved in stone said that Caesar Augustus is Lord. He is the Son of God and He is the Savior of the world. There are still a few of those stones. We've shown pictures of them before. And you don't contradict the emperor and live to tell your grandchildren about it. So many things could have gone wrong. Jesus could have been stillborn. Infant mortality rates at the time, it's estimated they were about 50%. Jesus could have died some months later from an infection he got in the stable. And then he never would have gone to the cross for the sins of humanity. Jesus could have lost his family as many children did. And without his family, Jesus would not have grown into the specific man that he became. And without Jesus, we would not have had a savior. You know, if the devil could stop Christ in the cradle, there would be no Christ on the cross. So you wonder how much of the devil's work and how, how hard the devil was trying at that time to stop the Christ in the cradle. Make no mistake. Faith in Jesus is not to be confused with rose-colored glasses. There is a cradle, but there will also be a cross for him, for you, for me. And yet Jesus is born because God will not be stopped. Love comes down a light in the darkness. God sent more than Miracles and messages, God sent his son, and, and Luke and John both tell it. That's why we had to read both of those gospels today, John and Luke. Luke tells it in, in the wonderful story with the details, with, with all those creatures you can put costumes on, you know? Shepherds and sheep and angels. We love to decorate kids and tell the story at Christmas in pageants. But John gives the meaning. Love is incarnate. God's love is incarnate is the theological word we use, in the flesh. Jesus is God's love come down. God in the flesh dwelling among us. Some translations read, God pitched his tent among us. Another translation reads, God, God came and moved into our neighborhood. And this is a new beginning. John, of all the New Testament writers, John dares to begin his gospel with the famous first words of all of Scripture. In the beginning, from Genesis 
And it calls to mind God creating the universe. And now John is trying to say there is a new beginning. In the birth of Jesus Christ, there is a new beginning. It is of God's making. And God decides when and where and how. And God just comes to us. It is not by human design or human effort. God just comes to us by pure grace, out of pure love. Years ago, <coughs> there was a man in an Atlanta airport, in the Atlanta airport, and he went into a restaurant to grab a bite to eat. And there was something on his plate he had never seen before. So he called over the waitress, and he says, what is this white glob on my plate? And the waitress says, those are grits. And the man said, I didn't order grits. And the waitress said, honey, this is Georgia. You don't order grits. They just come. <laughs> well, we don't order Christmas it just comes. You don't order grace. You don't order God. God just comes. Jesus among us, among all of our small days and small nights, our small ups and our ups and downs, all the things of our own little lives. Jesus is hardly seen at all unless we have eyes to see him. The eyes of faith. Martin Luther once said that he never would have done it this way. God saving us from sin and from ourselves in such a small way. Luther said if he had been God and he wanted to save the world, he just called in the devil and twisted his nose and said, let my people go. But that's not what God did. For you is born this day Christ the Lord. Max Lucado in an email devotion said that Jesus grew in Mary until he had to come out and be born. Jesus will grow in you until the same thing happens. He'll come out in your speech and in your actions and in your decisions. Every place you live will be a Bethlehem, and every day you live will be a Christmas day. In other words, you, you and I, like Mary, will deliver Christ to the world. Always small and yet always growing always going into the world bigger and wider, spoken more and more. Love came down at Christmas, a light in the darkness. God always comes and starts small. That way, God can always find a space in our hearts, find a space to do something new with you and with this big big world. Amen.